What's well, great about MAD is they even invite people from the dark side like me, so I hope that... Uh, <laughs> but being on the dark side uh, gives me... Oops, that's the wrong one? No. Okay, being on the dark side gives me the opportunity to really take a long step back. And uh, in 1820, one of my fellow countrymen um, wrote a very interesting uh, thought. You know, the destiny of nations depends on the way they f in which they feed themselves. Well, two centuries later, I think it's truer than ever. And uh, you know, the, our, planet, our entire planet's destiny is going to depend on how well we're going to feed ourselves in the next uh, 20 years or so. So the current... The current state of the food system is really scary. And, um, but I would like to show you in the next 15 minutes, 14 minutes, um, on why and how chefs can act today to help shape up the different revolutions that are taking place right now in the food world so we can gain control again about our own destiny. So I'm sure that most of you here today are very well aware of the issues that the food system is facing. Um, but when you are looking at all the different facts in different angles, it's really, really shocking. So allow me for just a few moments to walk you through some of these facts so you can you know, soak in the scale of the challenge we are facing. So first of all, our food is produced at a totally unsustainable way because food is produced at a huge energetic and environmental cost. But also, it's produced at a huge human cost. And most of you know, our modern Western diet is responsible for most of the diseases and health issues we're facing today. And all of that, while we're still wasting a third of what we're producing. So it's doubly absurd. Now, you would think things would change fast, but they are not. Because we are, you know, we are in a monopolistic situation and uh, things are not going to change by themselves. We are permanently brainwashed by the dominant ideology. And while we are, being we are being given the illusion of that we can decide, but we are not. In reality, we are victims of a disastrous storytelling and of cleverly organized disinformation system. Why would there be 57 legal names to name sugar in the US on a, on a package? Why name something Evaporated can extract when it's just plain cane sugar. You know, we need a revolution. So the, um, but that's not all. Um, oh, sorry. You know, do you think that's going to work that fast? Okay. Yeah. And we cannot really afford the statu quo because we are facing a huge increase in population. The most important being the number of people reaching the middle class which is great for them, but if we continue to feed the middle class, five billion people all wanted a Western diet in the next 35 years, it's almost impossible. We already have, you know, we, the experts predict that we need to double our crop production and especially our animal production in the future. But we're already using almost half of the available land to raise the corn, I mean, to grow the corn that feeds the animals, to feed us. So if we're already using half of that today, I don't know where we're going to fit. So it's just absolutely crazy to think we can continue with the same system. So we need a real revolution. And it, the flip side of that is, you know, it is actually happening. It's brewing. There is um, a revolution happening in different areas of the, um, of, of, of the, of the agriculture and food system. And as a venture capitalist, I'm you know, privy to um, a number of these um, uh, revolutions happening, a num number of the disruptions happening. We're seeing hundreds of startup companies being funded in these different sectors. And there are, I don't know if you're aware of that, but there are several billion dollars being invested every year for the past two or three years in these different sectors. So something is really happening. And I'm going to walk you through some of these sectors now and then look at the overall picture after that. So in, in botany, there is something really profound that happened in the past few years in microbiology. It is the understanding of what happens with mycorrhiza. And mycorrhiza is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and plant roots. So all the crop plants need fungi 
to survive because it's a symbiotic relationship where, where you exchange uh, glucides against mineral, and one cannot live without the other, really. Now, you would think, yeah, great, so what happened? Well, until now, industrial farming has been promoting deep tilling and the usage of herbicides, which actually are killing systematically all the fungi in the fields. So now you have a crop plant which is very fragile, which also has disrupted the entire water system around it. So that only survives because we are giving them this artificial you know, diet uh, made of whatever the Monsanto and other people are giving us. And that explains a lot of the issues we are seeing in the fields today. By the way, in parallel, we are, doing, uh, we are seeing a lot of development in um, uh, biotech companies, small biotech companies, who are studying what's happening with their own biome, you know, all these things happening here. And they are finding, which is, you know, at the end would make sense, but it's quite mind-blowing the first time you hear about it, we are finding that there is a huge amount of symbiosis between our own biome and the soil in which we are growing our food. So that if you are growing your vegetables and your chicken in the same area of where you are eating, you are in total symbiosis with them. But if you are not, you might not be in the same symbiosis. So expect some amazing developments in this area of microbiology in the next few years. The first being really about the revolution in agriculture going on. And um, in the past few years, what we have seen is the crop yields in industrial farming all over the world, including in the best areas of Western Europe, the best areas of, of the US, we have seen the, the crop yields going down, but also the nutrient content of the, of the crops, of the, uh, the vegetables and the cereals that we are eating, have been going down. So today, for example, in the UK, it takes about nine carrots to get the same nutrient level that would, you would be getting in the 1950s from one carrot. So it's also something that people have been aware of, um, but it's not widely publicized by the food industry. So we really need to stop growing plants on a fast food diet of inorganic chemicals and bring back the complexity and the power of biology into agriculture. And it's, this is just what permaculture is all about, is bringing back the biology into the field. So the, far, the, you know, the farm industry, is telling us, well, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale. Obviously not true, um, because we're not going back to the Dark Ages. It's not like going back to the Middle Ages and, and trying to do you know, things on a haphazard fashion. We have a lot of technology at our disposal. We can use soil microbiology analysis, which is you know, very different from looking at the soil component from a mineral point of view, but looking at the actual, um, actual microbiology inside. We can use satellite surveillance, we can look at a lot of things in the field to make the informed decision about what happened there. We can use um, other farming technologies such as precision farming, where you use GPS and stuff and satellite to, um, to um, optimize the way you go into your field. We can use um, micro drones, we can use small robots to bring the nutrients to the soil where they need it. You can use um, bio um, biodefense against uh, pests and so on, right at the right place. And this is working financially at a large scale. One of my companies, or one of the companies I'm, in, I'm invested in, is currently, um, is currently managing 55,000 hectares of fruits and vegetables. That's a lot of fruits and vegetables. And what we, what we do, we are passing the entire 55,000 hectares into uh, ecological farming into permaculture, and, and the, uh, the results are absolutely staggering. We obviously are lowering the input um, of the things we put in, because at the end we don't put anything in the soil anymore, once we are totally into permaculture, and, um, and our yields are going up by double digits every year. So whatever the, uh, the big farm industry is telling you is not true. Sorry, where, where is that? Where? So we are in uh, six different countries in a very exotic country like Suriname, down to uh, Turkey and Argentina and Uruguay and, um, and, and Belgium. So we're doing that in different places. The goal is really to scale up that a lot more, if we can. Um, in parallel to that, on the other end of the spectrum, 
we are seeing the rise, and I'm sure you guys have, are pioneers in, in many ways in that too, in the rise of urban farming. So urban farming is uh, the idea of being able to grow vegetables and fruits with species that don't need a lot of soil to start with. You know, see here. And, um, and what we are seeing is a number of initiatives to grow this, uh, these vegetables into small boxes. Um, we have seen, I'm an investor in one of these projects, or big boxes, like the size of a football field. And you can, you can uh, bring back the, um, the farming in the urban areas where you're going to get 80% of the population in the future. So this is working very well. It brings back a lot of uh, soil analysis and microbiology, but also computer programming, looking at LEDs, how do you program LEDs, how do you do these type of things. It's fascinating and it's really happening. But all that would not be possible by itself, so it's all, all interlinked, which is very exciting, without the food distribution revolution. And this food distribution revolution is happening because everyone is interconnected, everyone is using mobile phones in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia. And not only do they allow to do a better match between demand and supply, you can actually aggregate the demand and get, know exactly what you need to supply, but it also gives a access to market which was not possible for a number of decades to small farmers. So um, I picked a couple of examples, but you know, we have a, a new on-demand platform for aggregating demand for fish. And uh, I'm talking about line code fish from uh, artisan fishermen. So the guys know exactly the day after how many for example, sea bass, do they need to catch? So they, when they come back, they know exactly, you know, they're going to bring 100 kilos worth of sea bass, not 50 kilos, not 200 kilos, and that avoid waste and also have a better, um, a better impact on, on price equilibrium. So very interesting. Not possible five years ago. We are seeing a number of short circuit distribution models that are taking place, like the food assembly, it's called La Ruche, in France, another a company we have invested in, and they allow consumers to buy directly online from the producers in local virtual um, farmer's market, which are themselves organized by micro-entrepreneurs. So someone can say, well, I want to start a farmer's market in my, in, in my area in, in London or in Paris, or in this area of Denmark, and I'm going to find 200, 300 people that want to buy with me and the platform is going to allow me to do that. The, the amazing uh, thing there is that the farmers have a, you know, the, 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 the cut they are getting from that, which is around 80% or even more, is three to four times bigger than they were with the supermarket chains. So they can really concentrate on quality instead of just quantity, which is very, very important for the future. So, um, by the way, food assembly is starting in Denmark in a couple of weeks, if you guys are interested by participating. And all of that is really sustained by a change in behavior from the public towards you know, fresher food and going back to you know, knowing what's you know, provenance and what's inside. So I just wanted to add one more example of, of that, which is Cookpad, which is a Japanese company. I don't know, I mean, I know that some guys are from Japan, I'm sure they know it, because Cookpied really uh, is a platform that allows you to post, comment, and share recipes, cooking recipes. Now, there are 60 million uh, unique users of Cookpied in Japan, which is really about you know, two-thirds of all Japanese families using it every month. It's mind-blowing. And these guys have started recently in other countries. They just started in Indonesia, took off like crazy, there are 15 million, 15 million users. And they just started in Spain, there are 5 million users. And there are, you know, there are 7 million users in the Middle East. It's actually amazing, not because their stuff is so good, but because of the demand for it. I mean, it's like people want to share, they want to reconnect with their, with their culture and, 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 and the food that is behind it. So we are, using, we are seeing all kinds of you know, other startup companies using Food, food nutrition databases and software programs to match the consumer's demand for health and the recipes they are using. So lots of things are happening. It's really amazing. 
We're seeing hundreds, I tell you, hundreds of, of new ideas every month. Uh, of course, probably 2% of them are going to be successful. That's pretty much the ratio we're seeing in venture capital. But it's really, really interesting to see the, um, you know, five years ago there was none, not a single one. So it's very interesting. Now, what I wanted to bring up now is the fact that all these revolutions are going to happen anyway, but they could go one direction or another. You know, all, all, all revolutions can be hijacked by someone. Remember the French Revolution? You had Napoleon hijacked back to a centralized system. So it was not democracy, really, at the end. And here, we, you know, if we left it to engineers, we are likely to go toward a very different type of... I know I'm an engineer. So we are likely to go back to a very... to go to a different future that would may be made of, you know, soil and for, for, for lunch and then uh, healthy pills for dinner so we can spend more time in front of our computers. I think what chefs have the, an opportunity to help us regain a sense of joy, fun, and, and social fabrics through cooking. And that's very, very important that you guys realize the huge impact that you can have. Because we are not into a centralized world anymore. It's going to be a very decentralized world. Actually, I was looking for a metaphor for my ideas around that. And I came across this beautiful Romanesco broccoli. And which is, you know, an example of a fractal geometry in nature, which is really cool. Of course, as a mathematician, I love it. Because you can, you know, as you scale in and out, you get the same thing. And it makes the invisible visible, and more importantly, the order disorder and the disorder order, which is really, again, for a mathematician, fun. But it's a, it's a very resilient system. So we have, um, you know, if we go back to the first picture, I'm not going to go back to it, but if we go back to the first picture of the industrial farming of today, you see these very linear things. You see these long rows of cows, of chicken, of corn, of wheat, all aligned, all very clean, very Soviet style. Now, if we look now at the new revolutions, they're all happening at the same time, they're all in parallel, and they're all interconnected to one another. The fungi, the garden, the distribution system between people, the cooking, and the exchange of, of recipes. And actually, April Bloomberg this morning was talking about that, you know, how she got reconnected at different levels between our cooking and between our farming. It's, it's that. You are doing broccoli revolution. Because I think this is, you know, maybe how we should call that, you know, the broccoli revolution. But this broccoli revolution is still very fragile. We are still at the beginning of it. As I said, it could be hijacked back by the big farm industry, the big food industry. And we need to get to critical mass to make it very resilient. And so, we have, I, I know, it's very blurry chefs here. So you can see Jamie and Rene and Alex and David Chang, um, very blurry. But maybe it's, there's a purpose for it because I think chefs should go beyond the summit of the food and, and beyond gastronomy and really embrace this food revolution to help them make you know, joyful and human again. So I came up with a couple of ideas which I think are very, very, very important what, for what chefs should be doing very concretely in the next couple of years, really. And it's, first of all, we need to eat real food. We need to stop talking all the time about nutrition and talking about, you know, vitamins and stuff like that, because that's the way the food industry has been hijacking the conversation, you know. We, uh, you can come up with Oreo cookies which are full of vitamin C. It's not going to change the, the issue. And you guys are the best place to be able to do that. You need also to showcase the producers that are on your menu. The local producers are the, the, the real heroes of these revolutions. You got the you know, orchestra um, chef, but you have people who are playing. And the players are really the, uh, the, the farmers, the guys who are growing the thing, and it's very important to do so. And by doing so, you're going to be able to inspire a younger generation of farmers to come up to, to speed. Today, because of the ugliness of the injury of farming, you, people don't want to be farmers. If you talk to, we, this morning we were talking about how bad it is to be a chef. I tell you, being a farmer today is even worse because you see people around you catching, you know, 
developing cancer because of the all the products you are you're using, you don't want your kids to be farmers. And that needs to change. Otherwise, we're going to go and continue to be in a more and more industrial world. And the last point, it's a personal point, but I think we really need to move away from a you know, animal protein-centric uh, diet because we cannot sustain it. We just cannot sustain it. And we need to... And, and I know that Rene and, and, and others here have been there you know, to uh, showcase some of the uh, you know, vegetable-based uh, uh, dishes, but they should be the centerpiece of the menu, not just that. So I know I'm totally uh, into it, but just a, a last little thing here. It's, uh, I, Ten days ago, I was having dinner in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. show you that uh, venture capitalists travel a lot. And um, that's um, Radish and Rye. It's a farm-to-fork restaurant, a new one in Santa Fe. I encourage you to go there. It's really cool. But the really interesting thing is if you look on the, on the right side and zoom in on some of the things here, you have Body Farms in Las Vegas and uh, Three Sisters Farm in Glorieta. I know this place is because there is a high school there. Um, and six years ago, there was absolutely no market for any of these farms. Actually, some of these farms did not even exist. There was a chance encounter, talking about fractal and stuff like that, between a, a biology professor at the high school and um, a chef that took over the job as Sodexo manager for the area, the guys who are doing the disgusting school, school lunches for the, uh, for, the, for the schools. And um, they met, the, the guy from Sodexo said, well, let's try to bend the rules and allow the, the, the school to get some of the, the locally produced thing into the menu. And we, uh, with the uh, Jamie Oliver Food Foundation, got by serendipity, got alerted to that. We helped them organize a food revolution day at the school. They invited the entire community around this very poor area of New Mexico. It's one of the poorest counties. And they started to have a discussion. And other schools started to get in the bandwagon. And then the local um, government started to buy the food from these people. So today, six years later, you have a thriving community of organic farmers who have taken over. over. And now you even have in Santa Fe this type of restaurants that do that. So it's very much like you know, the, the old butterfly that changed the things. In a fractal world, you can have an influence from far away. Because not everyone here is a celebrity chef, but everyone is a master of his own world, which is his own kitchen. So you can start a revolution in your kitchen and then see it propagate from there. So each of you today has the opportunity, and I would call that social responsibility to help break the food system and build a better one. Because you, you are the butterfly that can make a food storm happen on the other side of the planet. Thank you.